The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the Eurostar Live Speaker Showcase. And our fifth and final presenter this week is Anne-Marie Sharrett, and she will be presenting Disruptive Testing. If you have any questions for Anne-Marie about her presentation, you can uh, post them into the discussion forum we've set up for you over on Test Huddle. And I'm just going to share with you now the link for that discussion. So directly after the webinar is over, we'll be heading across there. But for now, I'm going to hand you over to today's presenter, Anne-Marie, and she'll take you through her presentation. So hello, Anne-Marie. Hello there. How are you? Great. Here we go. Magic. Wonders of technology, hey? Okay, well, um, hello everyone. My name is Anne Marie Chart, and uh, I'm going to be talking today about disruptive testing. I mean, testing is disruptive, isn't it? I mean, when you think about it, um, when we go and speak to a developer who has stopped working on the code that they've been working um, and they've handed off and they've gone into a different area, and suddenly, you know, you come along and you found a bug in that area and you disrupt them, right? Um, and even when people are writing user stories, we, we, we want to be disruptive, really. We, you know, we're doing that because, not because we're vindictive, but um, we, we want to help um, find information about risk. Um, and even when people are writing, you know, user stories or requirements, um, we want, we want them to think about quality, right, before a piece of code is written. So we start asking them questions about risk, and, and we often disrupt their thought process. We disrupt their, their model of what they want to design and build. Um, you know, even, and, and in an agile team, it, you know, we, we are constantly um, being disruptive, but, but we do it because we want to help. We want to provide information. Um, but we get disrupted too, don't we? I mean, constantly we have these um, ideas of how we're going to do something and um, we, we, because we're often we're at the tail end of the development cycle, we often um, get disrupted in, in, in quite significant ways. Um, often, you know, things that happen at the start of, of testing, uh, sorry, at the start of development, they might not become apparent until testing and so sometimes we get disrupted quite significantly. Um, but yet we still have these, um, we ha we're still expected to be able to test um, as, if, as, if we'll be norm as if it's normal. Um, so really today's talk is about disruption, but it's mainly about how we as testers get disrupted and how can we manage that disruption. That disruption. Now something's not quite letting me go to the next screen. Oh, here we go. Fantastic. 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 <laughs> I don't know what this is. This is um, a, a picture taken in 1978. I'll give you a few hints. Um, and it's a picture of a, um, a rugby game. Um, it was taken in 1978, and it was when the Irish played uh, sorry, when the Munster played the All Blacks. And it was quite a significant moment because for the first time in history, um, the uh, in first time in history, um, the All Blacks, uh, the Munsters defeated the All Blacks 12-0. And um, you can imagine what it was like down in Cork in those times when, you know, people couldn't believe it. It was like the Munsters had beaten the All Blacks, and it was quite an amazing time, um, even to the point where um, I believe there was a play written about it because it was such a huge event. I mean, we like to be a little bit disruptive, don't we? Um, I think the Irish, are, we, we take a little bit of pride in that. Um, alas, my heart was disrupted about, you know, in, in the early 90s, um, and uh, I, I fell in love with um, a guy and his name was John and I was really really devastated and, and I decided that the only thing to do was to leave Ireland and to go to Australia and uh, that's that's um, w I went to Australia in 1993 and I, when I got there I was so 
homesick. I couldn't believe how homesick I was. You know, I found Australia really alien and, and foreign, and I was really badly homesick. Um, you know, I think people say, like, oh, Australia is so like Ireland, you know, we're, we're all the same. But, you know, it was just the little things that I found were really, really different. Um, things like, um, for example, you go to a barbecue, right, um, on a Saturday afternoon or something, and you'd arrive at this barbecue and there'd be all the men in one corner and all the women in the other corner and none of them was sort of mixing. And I'm like, this is so weird, this is so different to what I was used to in, in Dublin. And, um, you know, even their sense of humor was a little bit different and really dry sense of humor. And, and, and I found it very, very hard to take. And I remember one night I was standing there very, very feeling very sorry for myself, looking up at the stars in the sky and in Perth. And I was thinking, oh, oh, well, at least, you know, somebody over in Ireland is looking at the stars too. And then I suddenly realized that they're a completely different set of stars and I felt even more homesick. Um, but I do remember at that time thinking, um, what it must have been like. I'm having trouble getting past this. Hang on. Uh, just bear with me one sec. Here we go. Um, I do remember what it must, you know, I was thinking what it must have been like for the early settlers when they arrived in, the European settlers when they arrived in 1788 and how much, how alien that country must have been, you know. Um, just to give you an idea that uh, they have this bird called the kookaburra and it sounds like a ghost and the European settlers used to think that these people, that, that this bird was actually the ghost of the people past and uh, it just gives you an idea of the fear and the uncertainty. Um, and, you know, they nearly starved in the first few years when, when the European settlers arrived there. Um, you know, you think about uh, the European climate and how they were used to four seasons and, and um, you know, have these four very distinct seasons. And, and Australia is just not like that at all. It's a very temperate, you know, very different type of climate with extreme um, heat. Um, and obviously, you know, different times of the year. Winter is the hottest time of the year over there. And, and how they struggled to grow co crops to the point where they nearly starved. Um, and they were totally inadequ inadequately prepared um, for that environment. Their crops failed, their houses flooded, um, and their, even their clothing was, was impractical. Um, and it took a long time for them to adjust um, uh, to this new environment uh, because basically they were fundamentally trying to impose their European lifestyle into a climate that wasn't where it wasn't suited. You know, and I think, you know, so if we look back a bit at that and we go, oh, you know, how naive of them to, to do that. But, you know, if you look at software development and IT, we, we do the same. We actually try and impose order into what can be incredibly chaotic situations. Um, you know, we plan, we have this wonderful, grandiose idea when we start testing of, of how we're going to do software, how we're going to test our software, you know. And, um, you know, we have this very clear idea of our plans and we sit down and, and we, we spend a lot of time um, intellectually thinking about, you know, how, you know, what to do. And, and um, we have our gates and our milestones that we have in our testing processes. I mean, I remember very distinctly having all this. And, you know, we write a test plan and, and we need to get it signed off by our, by, um, our biz, you know, by other people, our stakeholders. And, and only when they've signed off the test plan that can we start thinking about the test documentation, about the test scripts. And, and uh, you know, we, we write all our test scripts and then we get them we get them signed, reviewed, and signed off, and, and it's only then that you know we can actually start testing, and and uh, we'll have a, a milestone too, and the milestones often you know there'll be a sort of checklist thing where thou shalt not start testing until all software has been developed and completed, and uh, you know thou shalt not start testing until all test environments are ready, and and, and really sort of quite stringent. Um, milestones that, that we do that. And we do that because we're trying to impose order, right? In our experiences is that, you know, things have gone wrong previously and, and what we're going to do is, is enforce um, these very, very stringent methodologies on our testing. And even in Agile, you know, 
Um, I, I see the same thing happening in Agile, which sometimes I find quite bizarre. That, you know, we have these test plans and test cases, and you know, maybe they're automated scripts instead of manual scripts, but you know, we have this, and, and then we execute and, and we report, and we have this very sort of linear process that we have in our minds that that's what testing is. Um, the only difference with Agile there is that we kind of we, we just do it in smaller, smaller iterations, right? We do more of them, but fundamentally often our thinking is, is quite similar to, to these large projects, in testing anyway. And, um, but the reality is that we know that things are going to go too badly, don't we? We really know that, you know, it's been very rarely that I have ever worked in a project where the test plan or the test approach that I decided up front you know, months ago or even, you know, 10 days ago really goes according to plan. Um, you know, something always goes wrong, doesn't it? I mean, even to the point where, you know, there's typical things that go wrong, right? For example, you know, we have, you know, a change request might come in or, the, you know, the, the business come and ask us to, you know, they have a different idea of what they want developed and they, and they want change. I mean, that happens. But things that we, you know, sometimes can't even think of it, you know, um, somebody will get sick, you know, or somebody and, and has to leave the project, the key developer, you know, um, or that, um, um, you know, that suddenly that the marketplace has changed and we've got new drivers and, and we can't predict a lot of this stuff and yet we plan as if we can. And uh, I just love this thing. I think it was on Twitter a while ago, and I, I don't know who did it. So, but you know, it's that that wonderful sense of you know we know in our hearts that um, the reality to our planning is a lot different to to how we initially attempt attempt it to be. And so I think you know in in our um, to counteract that, what we try and do is we try and get more and more um, deterministic and, and strict about our process and, and we, we say, well, the reason why our um, things went wrong the last time is because no one, no one adhered to the test process. You know, nobody, you know, we got to that milestone and instead of standing firm and saying, no, we're not going to start testing, we actually allowed the testing to happen. And, um, you know, or um, really we, we, we need to get more and more firm. People are not following the process properly and if only we can get people to follow the process, then our then our planning will be will work will work, um, and we try and get more and more precise with our estimates. Right, we we sort of go, okay, well, obviously our our, our estimates were out of whack. We we didn't have them right. Um, let's let's get our estimates even better. And so we try and get more prescriptive about um, the amount of of time it takes for us to test. And so we start doing these um, things like counting all the test cases from previous times and trying to, to estimate, you know, exactly how many test cases we're going to need. And, and, and you know, we really um, try and become very meticulous in what we do. Um, now, I have to say, personally, I haven't done this myself, but I have heard people trying to predict the number of bugs found. Um, you know, and I think, you know, when we start doing stuff like this, to me, we're starting to, en to enter into the kind of Lulu land a bit, you know, we're sort of, uh, the alarm bells start ringing, would start ringing in my head saying, come on, there's got to be a better way of doing this. But, but I, I do definitely know, and, and, I, and I definitely have done this in the past myself, is the attempt to, to get as predictive as possible in my testing and have this lockdown mentality to my testing. And I think that's, in some ways, it's kind of natural for ourselves to do that. You know, we don't particularly like change or chaos, do we? I mean, it, it, it can be quite stressful to, have it, to, to work in a chaotic environment. And we, we like to have, in some ways, predictability. We like to have neatness, especially when you know, we have a constant um, delivery to make to. And we want to be as efficient as possible. But you know, I'd argue that really, the stress that we have um, doesn't necessarily come from, um, you know, the chaos, but it comes because we expect there to be no chaos. We expect to have things running smoothly. And I think it's, it, in some ways, it's our expectation that's letting us down a little, right? Our expectation that, that things are going to go as they planned. 
uh, and they should do that. Um, and we're trying to get more efficient, you know. I think, um, you know, we look at, at what we do and we say we've got, there's got to be a better way, a, a more efficient way of doing this. And, and you know, this concept of we, we mustn't reinvent the wheel, right, which I think is quite amusing in a way because the, the wheel has been constantly reinvented since it first began. But, you know, that, that, that we, we, um, we, we look at this and we want to be more efficient. Um, one of the things that I see is that in, in our, in our um, drive to be as predictable as possible, we start descoping, right? Because, you know, to, to make things more um, estimates easier, to make things easier to predict, we take out the complexity, right? And if we take out the complexity in our testing, um, it's easier to estimate. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a story, I think it's about 50 years ago, um, uh, in Wales, the National Coal Board deposited sludge right on the hill, right up above um, a town called Aberfan, and it's called the Aberfan Disaster, and happened in 1966. And what happened was the, um, the coal mine that worked near were putting um, the sludge at the top of the hill right above the village, and they knew that this was a concern. Everybody knew that this was a risk. Um, and what happened is one day it was raining really, really heavily, and um, the amount of rain caused the sludge to go down the hill. And the sludge descended down the hill and hit the local school, and 150, 144 people died that day. And um, the, 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 in some ways, the, the coal board was so, were quite surprised by that, um, not because they didn't know it was a risk, but because their mental focus was all underground. You know, their, their security and their stringent, they were very stringent about security, uh, about um, safety underground. And so they had all these processes and things, but their focus was, was only underground, it wasn't above. And so, you know, they had missed this, this, even though they were aware of it, they missed this huge risk. And I think that's a big thing for us in testing where we have, you know, in our drive to be efficient as possible, um, that we do tend to descope, even if it's not consciously, we, we unconsciously descope the complexity in our drive to be as efficient and predictive as possible. And I think that's a real concern in testing. Onward bound. Um, now, a long time ago, a long time ago, um, there was a poet called Juvenalis, Juvenalis. And he had this Latin term called rara avis in terris nigroque similima signo. Now, I've probably pronounced that really badly, but I'll translate that for you. Um, and basically what it says is that a rare bird in the lands and very much like a swan. And around the 16th century, this was the, equi the equivalent of something, someone coming around to you and saying, Ah, yeah, pigs might fly. It was their way of saying, you know, this this will never, ha you know, that's that's a uh, will never happen. A statement of impossibility, really. Um, and and so that was quite a common term. Um, and then in the 16th century, or in 1697, a Dutch explorer, Willem de Vlaming, he discovered that black swans actually did exist in Western Australia. Oops. And uh, it's, a, it's a classic story that um, what happened from that is that Nicholas Taleb um, used this concept of um, a black swan as a metaphor, right, to describe something that um, happens as a big surprise. You know, it's like whereas they had thought that all swans were white, they now realized that black swans existed as well, right? Um, but um, he uses a metaphor to describe an event that comes as a surprise, has a major impact. And um, often people look in hindsight and say, oh, yeah, well, we should have recognized that, right? Um, and we see black swans a lot in testing. In fact, you could even say our job is to look for black swans, right? We, we want to find those unpredictable events that, that could create a, a major uh, trouble in our software. We want to hunt for those black swans. And so we are in effect black swan hunters. Um, but black swans affect us too. 
And so, you know, when we look at um, a business analysts coming in and telling us that the requirements have changed at the last minute, or that you know we've only got instead of the the, the software is um, ta has taken too long to develop, and instead of having the four weeks we estimated, we now have ten days. Um, these sorts of things, whilst they might not be hugely catastrophic, but um, they, they are certainly huge event, big events for us in our testing, enough to create significant impact in our testing. Um, and we have to learn how to handle those, handle those black swans in our testing. Um, Talib also talks about um, two different types of worlds, and I think this is really interesting. Um, he talks about um, there being a mediocristan, and he talks about being um, an extremistan. And really, when he looks at mediocristan, what he's trying to say there is that in mediocristan, it's where um, really you won't, um, things are quite predictable. You know, if you think about, um, say, Talib uses this example of um, um, having a thousand people in the stadium, right? And he's, you're going to measure their weight. And even if you have one person out of those thousand in that stadium who, say, weighs three times more than everyone else, the impact of that is not as significant, um, is not that significant. It doesn't make that much difference. And he says, so there, there are situations where um, it is easy to predict things. And he calls that world mediocristan. However, he also describes the, the world of extremistan. An extremist sounds quite different. He uses an example of um, looking at um, people's incomes in that stadium. So if you looked at people's incomes in that, that stadium, those thousand people, and Bill Gates was one of those people in there. Um, Bill Gates, who's worth, worth, I think, around 48 billion. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, but if you add that and then average that out, it's a, such a disproportionate um, amount that that has a huge impact on the average, right? In fact, to the point where the rest of our incomes in this, or the rest of the incomes in the stadium really just become a rounding error. Um, and so he describes this extremist stand as being a situation where, you know, uh, one event can have a huge impact on the rest of us. Um, consider. This, um, this was a study done by these two guys, which I won't try and pronounce their names because I'll probably get it wrong. Um, but they um, did a study with about 1,500 IT projects um, in, a, in 2011. And they discovered that the average cost of IT projects overrun is, is about 27%. And you know, when I look at that, and I think my experience in working in projects over the last 20 years or so, you know, that doesn't sound that incorrect, right? It sounds about right. I mean, I've rarely worked on a project that's run according to time and budget and had, you know, the quality and insured quality. Um, but, you know, to me, that sounds about right. Um, but then they go on to say, and this is what I think is really interesting, they say that one in six of those projects overruns by 200%. 200%, that is an enormous amount, with a schedule overrun about 70%. And to me, this is clearly, we're not living in mediocristan when we work in IT projects. We are living in extremistan. And I think we need to recognize that it is very hard to predict in, in our projects. I mean, and, and, in, and that in some ways, we need to find an alternative way of becoming better at estimating become better at um, handling these black swan situations. We need to start avoiding predictive. Uh, we need to avoid prediction. We really can't predict uncertainty. You know, by, by definition, uncertainty is the state of not knowing something. I think Michael Bolton said that. Something that's unpredictable can't be predicted. You know, if you think about how long is a test case, is that really predictable? How long does it take to write a bug report? I don't sure we can predict these things. How long to wait for a developer to fix a bug? 
you know, or how long, have, how, long, how long does it take for us to do retesting? These are things that are really, really hard to predict. And instead of trying to um, become deterministic in our, in our predictions, I think we need to start becoming more aware and avoiding the, that desire to be predictive. But what's the alternative? I think we need to start becoming more robust. And this is what Taleb um, suggests in his book, The Black Swan. You know, we need to become more robust to these situations. We need to become better at handling black swans when they appear. You know, we need to focus on, on being able to do that. And um, Michael Bolton talks about, you know, that we need to be prepared and empowered to, to deal with these situations. And for me, the key to doing this is to focus on testing as an activity. Right? and to focus on our skill as testers. Because if we build up our skill as testers, we, we become able to handle these situations. We become um, prepared. We know when we have skilled testers that we, be, we, we are able to deal with these situations more effectively. Okay, so I have this wonderful diagram that I invented myself. And I think this is not quite uncommon for a lot of places, organizations. We have our testing process. And often this is at the top of our, our, um, our triangle. It's, it's really important for a lot of organizations to have their testing process in place. And, and organizations often say, well, you know, we need to do that because we need to do things all the same. That's one of the common things that people talk about doing, you know, having a test process or, or we need to know what to do, or we need to know how to train our staff. And so there's a huge emphasis on looking at the testing process. And then underneath that, um, coming a very, very close second is our obsession with tools, right? I mean, in our desire to become efficient, what we do is we, we have um, our set of tools that we want to use to to help us support our testing process. So we have things like, for example, our test case management systems, or we have large automated frameworks which we do in our preferred tool of choice, be it Selenium or QTP or whatever that, be, that, that is. Um, and so we have a lot of tools that support our testing, our, our process. And right at the bottom, we have our testing. And it's often as if this testing is, is in a way incidental to our process and our tools. And I, I really want to change that. I want to change how we think, and I want to bring our testing right up to the top. I want, I want, us, to, I want us to look at our testing and, say, yeah, and look at it as, as a skilled activity, um, and to, to focus on bringing that skill out in our testers. And so I'd like to introduce you to the age of the thinking tester. You know, without a skilled tester, we know our tools are useless. We know that our tools are only as good as the tester who's using them. Um, but often we don't know how to improve our testing skill beyond the technical. So there's, um, when we recognize in testing that there's a problem with our testing, what we try and do is we try and improve our coding skills. And I think that's a real shame. Um, and I think one of the problems is that we, is we don't really know how to improve our testing skill. We don't even know what our testing skill is. And so clearly we will need to get better at that and, and better at recognizing what is our testing skill? What are the skills that make a really, really good tester? You know, one of the things I love to talk about is, you know, you put two testers side by side um, testing exactly the same application and one tester will come up with uh, yeah, I found this amazing core dump. I just I hit this button in parallel with that button, and then next thing I got this blue screen. And you know, this is really, really, um, it, you know, this is a really serious bug I found. And then the tester on the other side, who is, you know, has found something like, oh well, the the screen seems a bit off in its color. And you know, I think that's fascinating that you have two testers side by side, yet they provide often very, very different results. And um, we want to become better at knowing what, what skills our testers have. And, and I, look, there's definitely people out there, people like James Bach and Michael Bolton and a whole plethora of other people um, who are doing that, looking at tester skill and, and focusing. 
And um, I think we really need to take that into, into our um, corporations and our organizations and start focusing on that in our testing. So what would this thinking tester look like? Well, I think there's some core things here. Um, people talk about critical thinking. And really, I think this is one of the biggest things that I would encourage um, test teams and testing organiz organizations to focus on. Um, but the trouble is a lot of people really don't even understand what critical thinking is, right? It, you know, even if you go off to the, you know, critical thinking website, which is what I did, um, you know, trying to get a simple definition of what critical thinking is is really hard. But then Michael Bolton did me a huge favor and he came up with this wonderful, wonderful description of critical thinking, which I really like because I can remember it really easily. Um, and it's a really good one too. Um, Michael Bolton talks about thinking about thinking, all right, so thinking about thinking so you don't get fooled. And I think this is fantastic because we, can, we get fooled so many times in testing, right? Um, you know, we, we have um, lots of assumptions that are being made about testing. You know, we can assume um, that a developer comes up to us and gives us some code and he says, it's okay, I've tested that, there's no bugs in that software, right? Um, and we can get fooled by that because we can assume that what he's saying is right or what she's saying is right. Um, or we could get possibly get fooled when someone comes and tells us that the requirements or the user story is complete, right? Or if a test manager comes to us and says, well, the only, one way, only way to test is to follow our process. And so um, what, what thinking about thinking so you don't get fooled encourages to do is to think about, well, is that true? It, it challenges us to question these assumptions. It challenges us to, to think about whether these assumptions are true. Um, lateral thinking as well is, is I think very, very essential because to me the lateral, lateral thinking is looking at, um, at, at things in, a, in an alternative way. Edward de Bono says that you can't dig a hole in a different place by digging the same hole deeper, right? Just think about that for a sec. You can't dig a hole in a different place by digging the same hole deeper, right? So, you know, we need to have an alternative strategy. And often in testing, we really desperately need to think up new strategies. Um, we get so fixated by testing through a GUI, as if this is the only one way to test. And I think lateral thinking that helps us to look at alternative ways, to challenge us to say, okay, well, what other ways do I, can I test? Is testing th through the GUI the only way we can do this? Are there alternative solutions? So I think lateral thinking and critical thinking are, are essential. Um, but also complexity. I, one of the big things I see is that a lot of times people are, testers can be a little bit fearful about complexity. Um, and so they classify themselves as black box testers uh, as if, you know, it's not their job to look under the cover. As if, you know, I, well, I'm a black box tester, I'm a system tester, I don't, I don't look under the cover. But, but I think regardless of whether you're black box or white box or pink box or purple box or whatever box, I think, you know, not um, looking at and understanding a system, how it's architecturally made, understanding to some extent how the code is written, having conversations with developers at that level can only benefit your testing. Um, and I think that um, being afraid of complexity um, is, is no longer, we can no longer use that as an excuse in our testing. We need to be able to confront our fears and we need to be able to challenge ourselves to start exploring um, complexity. And we can do that. Um, and the final thing that I like in my little list here is communication. And, you know, I think often a lot of us as software testers, we look around, we say, well, actually, you know what, I'm not bad communicator. Um, you know, I can speak to developers and, and we can talk and, and often, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I, I, I do see testers generally being one of the better team members that are able to communicate. Um, I don't know if this is through practice or, or whatever, but or maybe it's through experience, you know. One of the first things uh, I remember when I 
uh, first started testing was um, I had this, I found this amazing bug and I was so excited that I'd found this bug and I went charging down the hallway at work and um, with this sort of bug note in my ear going, oh, I found a bug. And um, yeah, probably not the most appropriate way to, to tell a developer that their code has got a problem with their code. Um, and since then I've, I've learned a bit of humility and, and um, I use safety language a, a lot more uh, you know, to explain that perhaps there might be a problem with their code. Um, and I think generally as testers, we can get better, at, we are better at that. Um, what I, I don't see that we're getting better at is that being able to communicate above us and to stakeholders above our teams. So, you know, for example, talking to higher level test managers. One of my big bugbears in software testing is that we allow people who don't even test to make decisions about testing. So we allow the project managers to, to basically um, impose situations about how testing should happen when we really are the testing experts. And I believe part of the, the problem is that we're not practiced at explaining what we do and why it's wrong. And it's only through practice, it's only through talking to other people and explaining our processes and being able to explain our testing that we're ever going to become better at that. And you know that's hard for us. It, it takes a lot of courage as a tester to be able to, to, to break that, that mold and be able to, to talk to people um, in that way. But, but unless we, we really start taking ourselves seriously in that way, I really can't see how we can influence other people around us to um, suggest alternative ways of testing. So I think in that sense, communication is essential, in that manner is essential for our, for our thinking tester. Okay, lots of other ways we can do this. You know, uh, many of you are part of our community already, that's why you're here, and I think that's fantastic. Um, but also look beyond communities, you know. Um, I just come back from being at a developer conference. Wow, can that be intimidating? You know, I'm surrounded by these incredibly bright people who think in a totally different way to me. And I think that's great. I love that. I, I'm, I was so challenged to look at things in different ways and to think about uh, different approaches. And, and uh, I, came, I came out of that conference um, uh, a very different person to how I'd walked in. Um, so I think, you know, there's lots of ways we can gain experience. Um, obviously studying testing, but and development too. I think, um, you know, we, we, we don't test in isolation. And as much as we want to practice our testing skills and become really good at do, we, we want to be able to um, be aware of what's going on around us as well and um, to be aware of latest trends and things that are happening. So, so I, I would challenge us to, to be more aware of that too. Developing an opinion, right? Um, having a say about something, even if it's in a blog, you know, I, I think one of the greatest things I, I have found that has helped me is writing a blog. It's helped, it's helped me to really solidify my thinking. Um, it's helped me to, to think about what I really truly believe in. Um, so I would encourage lots of people to, to, to at least start writing a blog. Speak about testing, it doesn't have to be at a huge conference, but you know, even within your organization, having brand bag lunches and things like that. Lots and lots of things we can do to help ourselves be better at testing. Um, but of course, we can't have these wonderful thinking testers and put them into a sterile habitat where they will die for lack of water. And so we want to provide, as test managers, we want to provide a wonderful habitat where these great testers can thrive. And that's where our test managers come in. And I think test management has changed a lot in just even the last five years from one where you had the, the test manager who, who basically dictated how things were going to be and the test manager who was the only one who could possibly, you know, write a test strategy because, you know, they were the only person who had that experience, you know. Um, and, and that, that test manager who basically spent a lot of their time as well running around collecting metrics to, um, to give to, to stakeholders um, 
believing that that's what they want. Um, you know, a lot of time is spent doing that. I think that's really changing. Um, and I think test managers are becoming much, much more um, about um, offering information and um, assistance to their teams so that um, often it's more of a, a, a coaching mentality than a dictatorial um, mentality. Um, so you want to provide an environment where um, these, um, these testers can have autonomy to make decisions. There is no point having these wonderful testers and stifling their minds. We want to hear what they say. We want to work out the problems. We want to open that, open that the windows and let the air in, right? And, and let them breathe the air of, of critical and natural thinking. Um, obviously, we want to collaborate in a way um, that, that benefits the team and, and collaboration amongst testers um, and also um, with developers and those around us, right? Um, to adopt a continuous self-learning where, where, where we encourage people to discover new things, um, to learn new things, to explore. Um, one, in one company I was working with um, and I was coaching um, the testers there and I had a tester who came to me and they said, um, I really want to learn how to code. And uh, so I went to the company and I said, well, this guy really wants to learn how to code and he really wants to, to get better at that. And, and they said, well, that, we think that's fantastic, but there's no budget. You know, common, common situation anyway. And so I went back and I said, look, you know, um, this is the situation. And I said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, it's your responsibility to, if you, that's really what you want to do. It's your responsibility to learn that, to, to take that on board and do what you can. And the company will support you in any way they, they can, but they can't offer you financial assistance. And so he went off and he did, um, using um, these online courses, he went off and he learned how to code by himself. And I think that's, that, in a sense, is how, as test managers, we can really help our testers thrive. We give them the support and the space to let them you know, explore their testing and let, let them explore their insights. And we empower these testers. Um, you know, a lot of the time I see testers, um, I work and do a lot of exploratory testing, um, work with exploratory testing teams, and often when we're moving from, say, a more traditional form of scripted testing to an exploratory testing approach, a lot of the time it's not necessarily the stakeholders who are um, against it, it's the actual testers themselves. And I think that's really interesting because to me that suggests that um, the fear of something different, the fear of change. And so we need to empower these, help these testers empower themselves really to be able to make those steps and give them in a sense permission to do that and let them know that it's okay. Um, so exploratory testing I believe is one of the great ways we can become more robust um, because it allows us to um, be flexible in our decision making we are being flexible anyway because our strategy is developing as we go in exploratory testing. And so for me, I have found that um, using exploratory testing approach has, has really helped me be more, be more flexible and be more robust in my testing. Um, and I think it also helps us to um, have those testers focused on skill. It goes back to... We, you know, if we want to do exploratory testing really, really well, we need testers who are willing to, to skill themselves. And I, I like this circle because to me it, it talks about the things that we need as a, um, as a skilled tester to be able to, we, we need to practice these things, we need to, to be self-learners, we need to be autodidactic, but we also need to be aware of how we test. We need to look and be aware of what we're doing as we're testing. We need to become a lot more observant about what we're doing and then challenge ourselves to improve that. I mean, that's, that's how we're going to focus on our testing skill. Um, we have that auton autonomy, but a huge part of this is having the courage right, to take that step forward. And I think you know, providing safe environments where, where testers feel that they can um, make, take steps forward and, and help them to become um, make decisions in their testing, I think is essential. Um, so 
Um, one of the things, though, is what about the process, right? Um, and um, it, it can be hard. So does that mean if we're doing exploratory testing, you know, we don't have a process there? How do we know what we're going to do? Um, and you know, if we if we take our very formalized process or methodology away that relies on on um, a very explicit, formal, documented process, how are we going to know what to do? And I love this analogy that James Buck talks about, where he talks about having um, an internal structure, as opposed to a, a cockroach or someone like that who has an external exoskeleton. We have internal, we have an internal endoskeleton, and so in testing. Um, we can have that too. We can develop an internal structure that helps us to make decisions about what's the most appropriate way to test. And the real benefit of something like that is that we, we can become more robust, we become more adaptable, we're more flexible when we have that internal structure. We're more able to handle when, when black swans come our way. Um, this is really just a little exercise. I mean, when we look at this, in our heads, we actually round up these figures, don't we? Um, in order to really calculate how much money we have. We don't, um, if we want to get a rough idea of how much we're going to spend in a shop, we just round up each figure, and then that gives us a, a certain, uh, a rough idea of how much something is going to toss. And what we've actually done there is we've actually used a heuristic, a rounding heuristic, to roughly calculate how much um, money we're going to spend at the shop. And in the same way, we can do this in testing. We can use not necessarily rounding heuristics, but we can use heuristics to help us make decisions about what we're going to do, make decisions about well, what is the next thing to test? How can we develop a strategy in exploratory testing? How can we um, do, do our testing so that it's flexible um, and, and moves with, as the software development moves? Um, and so this heuristic is a, is a fallible way, and I think it's a really important to stress the fallible bit, because fallible suggests that it can go wrong, right? And um, Sometimes these heuristics, we, we, we have heuristics in software testing, and they, but they don't always apply to every situation. So we need to use them with skill. We need to use them, as Jane Buck says, they are, they're, they're context dependent. We, it, it depends on where, what environment we're using them that helps to, to decide what heuristics we're going to use. Um, fantastic, if you haven't, not aware of the heuristic test strategy model, I encourage you to go and have a look. It's on the Satisfice website. It, to me, this is a great document, a great starting place if, if you want to look at possible ways of developing a more heuristic, more flexible testing strategy. Um, and download it. Um, it's a fantastic website, lots of, lots of free information, um, lots of thoughtful ideas there as well to look at. Um, as Michael Bolton says, we can't predict the unpredictable. You know, we can anticipate it to some degree. Um, and I think, you know, that's, we want to do that. We want to, it's not that we don't want to, um, you know, have no estimates and, you know, we're just going to jump into testing without doing any planning whatsoever. We, we don't want to do that, but we have, we need to recognize that, that um, things are always going to go wrong to some extent and that we need to be able to manage that in some way. Um, and, and ultimately, we need to learn from that um, and learn from the experience that we have. Um, some reading material for you. Um, personally, I highly recommend the Black Swan and Testing blog series by Michael Bolton. It's really, really excellent and uh, you could read it lots and lots of times. Um, for those the more courageous, the Black Swan um, is, is worth a read. Anti-fragile takes the concepts of being robust uh, a step further. And of course, any heuristics um, out there, th there are many, many context-driven testers, many um, testers who use heuristics. And, and finding out more about that, I, I encourage you to research the area a bit more. OK, that's all for me. Um, thank you very, very much for taking the time out to listen. Um, and I hope, um, I think it's time for now Q&A. That's great. Thank you very much for that presentation, Anne-Marie. I'm just going to open up my screen again now.
Okay. So you should all see my screen now again. For those of you who are going to the conference this year in Dublin, you can attend Anne-Marie's uh, half-day tutorial on Tuesday the 25th, and she'll be looking at robotic testing. And the deadline for our super, bird, super early bird ticket is next Friday, so it's just one week to go. Uh, to the deadline on May 30th, and you can save up to 430 euros. You can also make even bigger savings when you register a group where every fifth attendee goes free. We're now going to move across the test huddle and look at all your questions. Let me share with you one last time the link. If you see there now, there is a link sent to you. It'll be in the little chat box there on the, your control panel. and that's everything now. We'll say thanks one more time to Anne-Marie for the presentation and thank you all for attending. We will see you over on Test Huddle for the Q&A.